I wanted to kick it off by saying how special today is. Um, it's special for a number of reasons, primarily because, well, well, you're here. That's the first great reason why uh, we're going to be celebrating this afternoon. Um, also because this marks uh, an appointment of Dr. Giroux as the Paolo Freire Distinguished Scholar in Critical Pedagogy here at McMaster. My name is Arshad Ahmed. I'm the AVP Teaching and Learning and also Director of the McMaster Institute for Innovation and Excellence in Teaching and Learning. And really for me, it's a, it's a pleasure and it's an honor to launch the Distinguished Scholar title and position with Henry's appointment. So the title itself is worthy of celebration, as I mentioned, and also because we have a partnership. Uh, this is Meadle and the McMaster Center for Scholarship in the Public Interest, which Henry directs. Now, Henry Giroux and the Paolo Freire Distinguished Scholar title he now holds extends a legacy that is vital to any institute dedicated, as we are, to the advancement of teaching and learning. And if you were here this morning where Henry led um, a seminar, I'm going to choose his work, I'm going to quote Henry, <clears throat> where he um, invited us to ask really hard questions about, quote, giving youth a chance to build capacity and agency to realize their own potential. And if you know Henry's work over the past 30 years, he has established himself as a pioneer in the field of critical pedagogy. He has envisioned and described a role for education as a political, moral, and ethical practice. And if you've read his work, and there's much to choose from, uh, from his groundbreaking texts, including the theory of resistance in education to neoliberalism's war against higher education, Henry's work asks educators to reconsider fundamental questions, including how we teach, under what conditions, and for what purpose, emphasizing the crucial intersections between education and public life. So in, in today's seminar, Henry also shared his vision of education and pedagogy where teaching and learning strategies respond to context, much larger context, broader context of democracy, social justice, agency, politics, power, culture, and community. And so this broad vision for teaching and learning that is critical in all of its meanings, and we really look forward to exploring it even further with Henry's leadership. And that exploration will be a prominent feature for our upcoming speaker series, which I'm very happy uh, that uh, Jenny Fisher is going to be uh, coordinating as she has this event. And through the series, we will hear from exceptional scholars like uh, Joel Westheimer, Brad Evans, Deborah Britzman, Antonia Darder, and Donaldo Macedo. And you can see a poster as you leave, uh, further descriptions uh, as to when these will occur. But first of, uh, of all, we begin this series with uh, Henry Giroux, a scholar, a teacher, colleague, and a friend. Henry is the professor for scholarship in the public interest in the Department of English and Cultural Studies here at McMaster. He holds a distinguished visiting professorship at Ryerson University and now the title of Paolo Freire Distinguished Scholar in Critical Pedagogy here at Meadle and McMaster. So of course it's tempting for me to highlight Hen Henry's vast scholarship, his achievements and his impact, but I think you'd rather hear from Henry what he has to say this afternoon. So what I'd like to do now is to present a little memento to Henry and ask you to please join me in congratulating him. For you. Oh, you're going to take a picture? Yes. You are? Yeah. I'm delighted to be here and I'm grateful that you're here. Um, I, I'm particularly delighted about this award because, you know, I, I worked with Paulo Freire for about 15 years. And during that time, we did the almost impossible. We started a series in education and cultural studies through which we get about 100 people tenure. <laughs> 
And the purpose of the series was not only to produce good work, the purpose of the series was to produce work that couldn't get published basically in the mainstream press. And so what we did was we brought together a number of scholars who published that work and had the requisites to get on, onto tenure tracks because they did exist once. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and we saw that as, a, as, a, as, as an important kind of political intervention, sort of bringing people together in ways that suggested a kind of solidarity that went beyond simply getting them jobs, getting them in, putting them in positions where they could actually make a difference in the world in which they found themselves. What I want to do today is, I, I, I usually don't stick to a script, but this, this is kind of systemic, and since it's inaugurating the series, I, I probably will stick to it more than I need to. But I, I want to begin by, by first making clear some of the larger corporate political forces that impact on education. I mean, I, I, I don't think you can talk about education without talking about those larger political and economic, cultural and social structures in which it's embedded. To isolate it as an institution and not to have any understanding of how it's being shaped by broader so political for and economic forces is to really miss the point of what, how, what the constraints are in terms of what, what many educators all, all of a sudden are facing and what they're working under. Then I'm going to talk about some concerns that I've had for a long time that are embedded in my writing. I want to just briefly talk about academics as public intellectuals because I, I believe there's never been a greater time for academics as public intellectuals as there is now. The university is under enormous assault and it seems to me that we need to be able to defend what we do. And you know, you, you, if you really believe that the essence of power for academics is having some control over the labor process, your own pr labor process, then you, be, you might be able to think, we, we need to think very hard about what it means to defend the university in ways in which people who don't even have young people in the university would be able to say the university counts in a democracy. It matters. You have to have it. It's crucial. It works. It's central. Then I want to talk a little bit about the relationship between what I call pedagogy and insurrectional democracy. And finally, I want to talk about the question of educated hope and what I think that means in terms of developing a theory of resistance. Across the globe, the forces of free market fundamentalism are on the march. Dismantling the historically guaranteed social provisions provided by the welfare state, defining profit making as the essence of democracy, increasing the role of corporate money in politics, waging an assault on unions, expanding the military surveillance security state, widening, uh, promoting widening inequalities in wealth and income, fostering the erosion of civil liberties, and undercutting public faith in defining institutions of democracy. The ideological script is now familiar. There's no such thing as the common good. Market values become the template for shaping all aspects of society. The free possessive individual has no obligations to anything beyond his or self-interest. Market fundamentalism trumps democratic values. The government is the arch enemy of freedom. And private interests negate public values. Consumerism becomes the only obligation of citizenship. Law and order is the new language for mobilizing shared fears rather than shared responsibilities. And war becomes the all-embracing organizing principle for society and the economy. With, with the return of the Gilded Age and its dream worlds of consumption, privatization, and deregulation, not only are democratic values and social protections at risk, but the civic and formative cultures that make such values and protections central to democratic life are in danger of being eliminated altogether. As market mentalities and moralities tighten their grip on all aspects of society, democratic institutions and public spheres are being downsized, if not altogether disappearing. And as these institutions vanish from public schools to healthcare centers, there's a serious erosion of the discourse of the discourses of democracy, community, justice, equality, public values, and the common good. And one consequence is the emergence of what the late Tony Jutt called an eviscerated society, one that is stripped of the thick mesh of mutual obligations and social responsibilities to be found in any viable democracy. This grim reality has been called a failed sociality, a failure of the power of the civic imagination, political will, and open democracy. It's also part of a politics that strips the social of any democratic ideals and undermines any understanding of higher education as a public good, 
and pedagogy as an empowering practice, a practice which acts directly upon the conditions which bear down on our lives in order to change them when necessary. At a time when the public good is under attack, there seems to be a growing apathy towards the social contract or any civic-minded investment in public values and the larger common good. Education, it seems to me, has to be seen as more than a credential or a pathway to a job. It has to be viewed as crucial to understanding and overcoming the current crisis of agency, politics, and historical memory faced by many young people today. And one of the challenges facing the current generation of educators and students is the need to reclaim the role that education has historically played in developing critical literacies and critical capacities. There's a need to use education to mobilize students to be critically engaged agents, attentive to addressing important social issues and being alert to the responsibility of deepening and expanding the meaning and the practice of an insurrectional, in my estimation, an insurrectional and radical democracy. And at the heart of such a challenge is the question of what education should accomplish in a democracy. What work do educators have to do to create the economic, political, and ethical conditions necessary to endow young people with the capacities to think, question, doubt, imagine the unimaginable, and defend education as essential for inspiring and energizing what we might call critically engaged and socially responsible citizens. In a world in which there is an increasing abandonment of egalitarian and democratic impulses, what will it take to educate young people to challenge authority? And in the words of James Baldwin, rob history of its tyrannical power and illuminate that darkness, blaze roads through the vast forest so that we will not, in all of our doing, lose sight of its purpose, which after all is to make the world a more human dwelling place. What role might education and critical pedagogy have in a society in which the social has been individualized? Emotional life collapses into the therapeutic and education is relegated either to a private affair or a kind of algor uh, algorithmic mode of regulation in which everything is reduced to desired measurable economic outcomes. Sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> Feedback loops now replace politics and the concept of progress is defined through the narrow culture of metrics, measurement, and efficiency. In a culture drowning in a new love affair with empiricism and data, that which is not, not measurable withers. Lost here are the registers of compassion, care for the other, the radical imagination, a democratic vision, and a passion for justice. In its place emerges what Goya, in one of his, one of his engravings, prophetically termed, the sleep of reason produces monsters. Goya's title is richly suggestive particularly about the role of education in pedagogy and compelling students to be able to recognize, as my colleague David Clark points out, quote, that an inattentiveness to the never-ending task of critique breeds horrors. The failures, the failures of conscience, the wars against thought, and the flirtations with the rationality that lie at the heart of the triumph of everyday aggression, the withering of political life, and the withdrawal into private obsessions, unquote. Given the multiple crises that haunt the current historical junk conjuncture, educators need a new language for addressing the changing context and facing issues, and issues facing a world in which there is no, there is an unprecedented convergence of resources, financial, cultural, political, economic, scientific, military and technological that are increasingly used to concentrate powerful and diverse forms of control and domination. And such a language needs to be political without being dogmatic. It needs to recognize that pedagogy is always political because it's always connected to the struggle over agency. In this instance, making the pedagogical more political means being vigilant about those very moments in which identities are produced and groups are being constituted or objects such as knowledge are being in some way created. At a time, at the same time, 
It means that educators need to be attentive to those practices in which critical modes of agency and particular identities are being denied. For example, the Tucson Unified School District Board not only eliminated the famed Mexican-American Studies Program, but also banned a number of Chicano and Native American books it deemed dangerous. And these are really dangerous books. For instance, the ban included Shakespeare's play, The Tempest, and Pedagogy of the Oppressed, as you know, by the famed Brazilian educator, Paulo Freire. This act of censorship provides a particularly disturbing, disturbing case, although quite symptomatic, it seems to me, of a war that's being waged in the United States, not only against young people marginalized by race and class, but also against the very spaces and pedagogical practices that make critical thinking possible. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of, of Hopper's comment about sociology, right? I mean, we can't do soci, we don't want to do sociology. You know, the implication being that the last thing we want to do is look at a discipline and learn how to think critically, which then might hold power accountable, such as what he's doing in the oil fields. <laughs> Can't have that. You know, I mean, after all, any, any educator or professor who wants to move in that direction has to be censored, as are the scientists who sign government contracts and now can't reveal information which might be critical of those fields. I mean, there's no other way to talk about this. This is not just censorship. This is the form of cultures that makes totalitarianism possible. That's what it does. It's not just about dissent. It's about shutting down those spaces where any articulation that in some way makes power accountable all of a sudden becomes dangerous. Thinking becomes dangerous along with the places that produce that thinking. It seems to me that such actions suggest the need for faculty to develop forms of critical pedagogy that not only inspire and energize, they should also be able to challenge a growing number of anti-democratic practices and policies while, res while resurrecting the ra a radical democratic project that provides the basis for imagining a life beyond a social order immersed in inequality, degradation to the environment, and the elevation of war and militarization to national ideals. Under such circumstances, education becomes more than an obsession with accountability schemes, an audit culture, market values, and an unreflected immersion in the crude empiricism of a data-obsessed, uh, market-driven society. It becomes part of a formative culture in which thoughtlessness prevails, providing the foundation for what Hannah Harant once called the curse of totalitarianism. And at a time of increased repression, it's all the more crucial, I would think, for educators to reject the notion that higher education is simply a site for training students for the workforce, and that the culture of higher education is synonymous with the culture of business. At issue here is the need for educators to recognize the power of education in creating a, the formative cultures necessary to both challenge the various threats being mobilized against the ideas of justice and democracy, while also fighting for those public spheres, ideals, values, and policies that offer alternative modes of identity, alternative modes of thinking, social relationships, and politics. In both progressive and conservative discourse, pedagogy is often treated as simply a set of strategies and skills used to teach pre-specified subject matter. In this context, pedagogy becomes synonymous with teaching as a technique or the practice of a craft-like skill. Any viable notion of critical pedagogy must grasp, I would think, the limitations of this definition and its endless slavish imitations, even when they're claimed as part of a discourse of a radical project. In opposition to the instrumental reduction of pedagogy to a method which has no language for relating the self to public life, social responsibility, or the demands of citizenship, critical pedagogy illuminates the relationship among knowledge, authority, and power. And central to any viable notion of what makes pedagogy critical is in part the recognition that pedagogy is always a deliberate attempt on the part of educators to influence how and what knowledge and subjectivities are being produced within particular sets of social relations. This approach to, to, uh, to pedagogy does not reduce educational practice to the mastery of methodologies. It stresses instead the importance of understanding what actually happens in classrooms and other educational settings by raising questions regarding what's the relationship between learning and social change? What knowledge is of most worth? What does it mean to know something? And in what direction should one desire? 
Pedagogy is always about power because it can't be separated from how subjectivities are formed, desires are mobilized, how some experiences are legitimated and others are not, or how some knowledge is considered acceptable when other, other forms are excluded from the curriculum. You know, I, I grew up in a working class neighborhood in Providence, Rhode Island. And in that neighborhood, there was lots of talk about unions. And there were lots of talk, believe it or not, some of you are much too young, about the Wobblies. You know, and about a long tradition of workers' struggle. And then I went to school. And all of a sudden, I discovered that history wasn't about the wor workers' struggles, wasn't about feminist struggles. It wasn't about struggle at all. It was about the history of white men acting alone. And as Brito Breck once said, did Napoleon really cross into Russia alone? And this is what we began to learn. All of a sudden, the disimagination machine came into play, in which you get wiped out of the history, effaced. The signature is gone. There's no trace. All of a sudden, whatever history you bring, whatever attributes you bring, are now deficits, because they're not defined as being mainstream. They're not just excluded. They're deficits. They're inferior forms of knowledge, inferior values, inferior types of social relationships. And when I was in that, young, that Catholic school as a young kid, and we had a test, and I pulled my partner, Emilio Natlizzi, over to my side, and I said, let's do this together. And this nun came running down the corridor, threw an eraser, hit me at the back of the head, and he gave me my first lesson in the hidden curriculum. She said, you never learn together. I said, oh, <laughs> that's odd. You know? In my neighborhood, that's all we did was learn together. It was a collective enterprise. But that was where it began. It seems to me that pedagogy as a moral and political practice is a moral and political practice because it offers particular versions and visions of civic life, community, the future, and how we might construct representations of ourselves, others, and our physical and social environment. But it does more. It also represents a version of our own dreams for ourselves, for our children, for our communities. And such dreams are never neutral. They're always someone's dreams. And to the degree that they're implicated in organizing the future for others, they always have a moral and political dimension. It is in this respect that any discussion of pedagogy must begin with a discussion of educational practices as a particular way in, to organize knowledge, identity, place, worth, and meaning. So central to, the, to, to my assumption, my argument, is the assumption that politics is not only about the exercise of economic and political power, but also, as Cornelius Castoriadis points out, has to do with political judgments and value choices, indicating that questions of civic education and critical pedagogy are central to the struggle over political agency and democracy itself. In this instance, critical pedagogy emphasizes critical reflection, bridging the gap between learning and everyday life, understanding the connection between power and difficult knowledge, and extending democratic rights and identities by using the resources of history and theory. However, many educators and social the for many educators and social theorists, there's a, a kind of widespread refusal to recognize that education does not only take place in schools, that there's a range of cultural institutions, extending from mainstream media to the new digital screen cultures that engage in what I've called forms of public pedagogy which is central to the task of either expanding and enabling political and civic agency, to put it bluntly, or simply shutting them down. At stake here is the crucial recognition that pedagogy, again, is central to politics itself because it's about changing the way people see things, recognizing that politics is educative. And as the late Pierre Bourdieu reminded us, the most important forms of domination are not only economic, but intellectual and pedagogical and lie on the side of belief and persuasion. I would go so far as to say the great failure of the left in North America is precisely about the refusal to recognize that. The refusal to believe that education matters, that pedagogy matters, that changing consciousness matters, that making points of identification that link the politics we're talking about to the investments that people have in their own lives matter. My father once told me that he was in the factory working and a group of SDS students came to see him. And he said, uh, Henry, I, they talked about some guy, Fauzi Dung, I said, really? Yeah. I said, 
Fao Zedong, you ever heard of him? I said, yeah, yeah, Chinese guy. <laughs> Little revolution in China. <laughs> he says, that's great. He says, why are they talking to me about that? He says, my plan is you know, filled with all kinds of uh, f chemicals that are poisoning everybody in here. We can't breathe properly. You know? We don't have ventilation systems. You know? He says, why don't they talk to me about that? You know? why, don't we talk, why don't they talk to me about organizing in the, in what it would take to organize in that factory? Why don't they talk to me about how I feel about politics and how it bears down on my life and what I can learn from it? But he said, he, he said these are white middle class kids. They came from Colombia. You know, Colombia. You know, that citadel of justice, right? <laughs> Neighborhood expansion in Colombia. Talking to my father about Mao Zedong. This is not to say that there isn't a lesson there, right, to be learned. But the disconnect is what's troubling. This inability to understand the context in which people define themselves and the problems that, in fact, inform their lives, as if that isn't a pedagogical issue, as if that isn't a political issue, you know, as if the educative nature of politics doesn't matter. This is why we have so many white kids from ruling class neighborhoods who believe that the vanguard is all that matters. I mean, this is why political purity is on the rise again, a kind of moralism infused with a kind of arrogance that makes Donald Trump look like he's on the left. Sorry, didn't mean to go off. <laughs> Just as I would argue that pedagogy has to be made meaningful in order to be made cri critical and transformative, I think it's fair to argue as, I'm, as I, I've been saying, that there's really no politics without a pedagogy of identification. And that is, people have to invest something of themselves in how they're addressed or recognized so that any mode of pedagogy or idea has to speak to the, their conditions and provide a moment of recognition. Lacking this understanding, pedagogy all too easily becomes a form of intellectual and symbolic violence, one that assaults rather than educates. One can see this in forms of high stakes testing and empirically driven teaching approaches, which dull the critical impulse and produce what, my, my, what I call dead zones of the imagination. We also see it, such violence in schools whose chief function is repression. Such schools often employ modes of instruction that are punitive and mean-spirited and are largely regimes of memorization and conformity. I mean, for those of you who have young kids, you're beginning to see this, right? I mean, kids all of a sudden find themselves taking tests all day. They're not doing art. They're not creating together. They're not using their imaginations. And they come out like, and they look like they're sleepwalking. You know, they, they're, I mean, they're learning quickly that schooling has nothing to do with pleasure. They're learning that the pleasure of learning really doesn't exist. It's not, it's not an association that they need to make anymore. Expanding critical pedagogy as part of a mode of public pedagogy suggests being attentive to addressing modes of knowledge and social practices in a variety of sites that encourage critical thinking, thoughtfulness, dialogue, but also opportunities to mobilize instances of moral outrage and social responsibility and collective action. You know, I, I often make a distinction between academics and intellectuals. And when I'm feeling grumpy, I say academics don't know how to dance. You know, they, they don't have any, they, they don't know how to identify with Keith Richards. You know, they don't get it, right? But they also tend to take nuance a bit too seriously. You know, they tend to believe that, oh my, look at this, well, there are 14 issues here and 25 issues here. So they never get angry. The sense of moral outrage tends to be lacking sometimes. You know. There's a sense that they have to be bound by the disciplines. That any problem that crosses disciplines, that should be addressed in the interdisciplinary unit. <laughs> you know. Let's send them over there. They have, a, they have an answer for that one. You know. I mean, solidarity all of a sudden becomes a, a cesspool of resentment. Oh, look at so-and-so. He's publishing 20 books. And I only have two. What's going to happen to me? We, we've lost the common vision. You know, there's, there's a way in which the neoliberal ethic has crept into the university and created these divisions in which the only thing that exists is shared fears rather than shared responsibilities. A shared sense of what it means to make the university a political space that matters. One in which questions of pedagogy can be talked about. I have a colleague, David, David Clark. I mean, we sh I can't write anything without sending it to him. And he's back to get back in five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. No, let's talk. Jesus, what happened to this stuff? You know, am I just a child of the 60s? Did I lose something here? I mean, it actually used to work. People would sit down, have study groups. 
talk to each other, recognize that the work that they were dealing with pedagogically had political implications. When I was exiled to Miami University in the 1980s, I thought, oh my god, I'm in cow country. What am I going to do? This is horrible. And then I got there and I discovered there were 20 other faculty who were also fired that year. <laughs> they also didn't get tenure, as I did, because of John Sober. And we had the best study groups, the best parties. Derrida came every other month. Leotard was there endlessly. The place was on fire. Fire. You know, your imagination soared. You know, there was something about walking into those rooms and sitting down. And, all, and there was electricity. And nobody said, Jesus, are you the smartest person in the room? I'm not. Am I not? That was gone. That kind of competitiveness didn't exist. It wasn't there. We talked to each other. We tried to figure something out. You know, we tried to s bring students in and create something that replicated and mimicked something of the 60s. And I think it's probably fair to say that even when we talk about pedagogy in this sense, as I'm, as I'm doing tonight, don't kid yourself. You can't talk about pedagogy as anything other than the outcome of struggles. It's not just something that appears and says, oh God, I, I, I'm the head of a teaching and learning center, not you, Ashad. I'm the head of a teaching and learning center, and, and here's a pedagogy that I've invented that we're going to now use. These are outgrowths of struggles. When you think of what happened with the free speech movement and the civil rights movements of the 1960s, and their struggle to get eth ethnic courses in the curriculum, to all of a sudden to get the present absences eliminated so that people could talk about groups that in some way had histories that had been dislocated and eliminated. There was a revolution of sorts. The university all of a sudden truly began to represent, at least ideally, it had a language for what it meant to be a public sphere. And then the conservatives freaked out. They became hysterical over this. And it wasn't simply because people were making new demands on the university. It was because, as you could read in the closing of the American Mind, the American Mind, they were afraid that these various groups that would now come into the university and expand the repertoire of students there would someday occupy positions of leadership. Blacks as leaders, Puerto Ricans, Browns, brown people, women of color. <laughs> you know, and they were very upfront about this. I mean, read the, read the closing of the American Man. He's up front. Well, he says, you know, they shouldn't go to elite universities. They shouldn't have blacks in elite universities. Right there. You know, just like, John, just like Trump. You know, a kind of power so arrogant in its dismissal of everything else that it'll say anything. This is why I like the neoliberal moment we find ourselves in. Because there's an arrogance that now informs it that allows people to say things they wouldn't have said 10 years ago. I'm a racist, isn't that great? And I don't believe in political correctness. <laughs> oh, aren't we lucky? But at least it makes power visible. At least there's a sense of what we're dealing with in terms of how that ideology is mobilized. The worst dimension of power is when it makes itself invisible. And you can't see it. You don't know how it works. You don't know what, you don't know what its trappings are. But it seems to me that one of the good news in part of this is that increasingly what we're seeing in Latin America, what we're seeing in the United States, what we're seeing in Chile, what we're seeing in France, and we're seeing young people mobilize. You see it with the Black Lives Movement in the United States. You see it with the Quebec student movement. We've seen it in France where students are mobilizing because they understand something. And what they understand is they've been written out of democracy. They've been written out. They're not in that script. In this particular historical conjuncture, something has happened that we've never seen before. And what we've seen happen is that you have a whole generation of young people who are considered disposable. Disposable. As my friend Zygmunt Bauman says, you know, this is the zero generation. Zero jobs, zero, zero future, zero possibilities. And one way to begin to understand this logic of disposability as it now is part of this neoliberal logic is to understand that you have a ruling and financial elite that doesn't care about the social contract anymore. They don't need it. They float. Power and politics have been separated. Power is global and politics is local. And so the ability to name things is local. The ability to get them done is global. We don't have a script for this. This is a new kind of politics. And it's a politics that has generated an indifference to human life and, and produced such misery
massive inequality. I mean, what does it mean to make the claim, as I said to the seminar this morning, that the Koch brothers make $3 million an hour on their dividends? On their dividends. Do the math times 24, uh, no, do the, 40 hours a week. <laughs> you know, do the math and figure out how long it would then take them to spend that money. But of course, that's not the real issue, right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm not resentful of rich people. I'm resentful of the power they have. That's what I'm really resentful of. I don't care if they have millions, but I do care when they subvert, when they, when they subvert politics and they buy it. I care when I see this little kid that was just on, uh, is all over the news, you know, the pharmaceutical guy. He looks like a young version of Gicko in Wall Street, right? Who says, I care about money more than people, so he, he increased the price of a, a, a drug that uh, HIV people and, and people who have cancer use from $75 a pill to something like, what was it? 5,000, right? It was a 5,000% 5, 5, increase. And then he brags about it, you know? And so the question has to be raised, where's the formative culture that produces people like him? How does it get created? Who produces it? Who legitimates it? How do you associate it with power? How do you begin to understand it? What does it mean in terms of the role that intellectuals might play in, in dealing with this stuff? And so it, it seems to me that in the age of irresponsible privatization, unchecked individualism, celebrity culture, unfettered consumerism, and a massive flight from responsibility, it's become more and more difficult to acknowledge that educators and other cultural workers bear an enormous responsibility in opposing the current threat to the planet and everyday life by, it seems to me, bringing democratic culture back to life. And I think that lacking a self-consciously democratic political focus or project, teachers are often reduced to technicians, and I'm, I'm talking about public schools and higher education. Uh, or functionaries engaged in formalistic rituals, robbed of, of what we might call the ability to, in, in, in some way, or in, ensconced in professional mandates that, for the most part, do everything they, they, they can to eliminate the critical function. They make time a deprivation. We bring in new faculty, we put them on 400 committees. And then we say, you got to get tenure. And then we wonder why they can't, or why they're not writing. And at the same time, the university is hiring. In the United States, there are more now more administrators than there are faculty in the United States. So what you now have is you have modes of governance. When I say that we need to create uh, uh, academics, as academics need to be public intellectuals, obviously, pedagogically, one thing that we can't ignore is you can't do that without the conditions existing for them to function as intellectuals. So if we're going to talk about higher education as a democratic public sphere, the question becomes, what are the conditions that make that possible? It doesn't become possible when 70% of your academics in the United States, for instance, are temps. You know, there's some colleges that are hiring temp services to now hire temporary faculty. <laughs> I mean, it just says it all, doesn't it? They don't, they don't even have to deal with the university. You go to a temp service, like, you know, you want to be a temp worker, a clerk in, in Walmart. And it seems to me this Walmarting of higher education, which is basically what it is, and as my friend Noam Chomsky says, you know, this is really an attempt to basically increase academic labor, while at the same time increasing labor servitude. That's really what this is about. And so around this question of academics as public intellectuals, there's the inextricable issue of the question of university governance and what that means. Susan and I once wrote a book called Take Back Higher Education, for which I think we both got fired at Penn State in indirect ways. And that's exactly what it's about. It's about taking back higher education, redefining it as a public good, talking about the conditions that make, it, make, make operative the necessity or the need or the opportunity for people to be public intellectuals, to address issues that matter, to relate their work to social issues that in some way can suggest that what we do in the university is part of a larger public good. That's not a small matter, because it seems to me the university is under siege in a way like we've never seen before. Never seen before. We're not just talking about a McCarthyite period in which isolated individuals were mocked out as being communist and then lost their jobs, or people in the film industries, people like Dalton Trumbo, and that whole crew who refused to name names and ended up going to jail. We're talking about assaults on the very definition and organization of, of the university. You know, I'm, I'm watching TV today, and you know, as an ex-Catholic, I'm listening to the Pope, you know, and I'm thinking, hmm, this is interesting. The Pope comes to the United States 
and he speaks to a Congress so reactionary that when they get, go home, they break off the heads of squirrels for fun. And I'm thinking, he's talking about pollution. He's talking about poverty. He's talking about the need to deal with the immigration crisis. He's talking about racism. He's talking about police violence. Why is it we hear that from a pope, but there is really barely one educational leader who's the president of a university in North America who addresses the same issues? What does that say about what's happened to questions of leadership in the university? Sorry, I can't talk about those issues. I'm out fundraising tonight. You know, I, I, have, I have other priorities. So it, it, it seems to me that if you're going to talk, we're going to talk about pedagogy and we're going to talk about governance, we have to talk about them in an interrelated manner, that it's absolutely impossible not to do that. And we have to begin to fight for institutions that in some fundamental way begin to address those issues. The other, the other side of this is that I, I think that something has happened to the neoliberal university that we all know about. And you increasingly see it with students. And it may be, and I think it's difficult for students to break away from this. There are exceptions and we see them. But something happens when students are now defined as customers. Something happens when students are now defined as getting a service in education. Something happens when all of a sudden I walk into the student center at Mac University and it looks like I'm in a mall. They're selling clothes. Why are they selling books? They're selling videos. Why are they having presentations? Why aren't they having talks? I mean, what happens when a university so instrumentalizes itself in the language of the marketplace that all of a sudden, it's not just that you elevate all the worst dimensions of capitalism, finance capital, it's that you eliminate all the values that matter for a democracy to sustain itself so that we have no language for linking power to justice. What happens when you have an economic system that literally believes that it doesn't have to be in any way taken into consideration social cost. What role does the university have in addressing those issues? What role do we have? What's the pedagogical function of intellectuals in dealing with this stuff? I mean, do we work collectively? Do we somehow try to find connections with people outside of the university? Do we redefine and attempt to redefine the nature of education itself? Do we begin, I mean, is it necessary to begin, for instance, to talk about education as a, as a public good? You know, my friend Stanley Aronowitz claims that what we need is we need a revolution in what he calls the radical imagination. And he's not just talking abstractly. He means that we need a revolution in which the imagination is linked to reclaiming those places and spheres, institutions and practices in a society that can provide an old, a, a way of thinking about the future that doesn't mimic the present where there's a kind of tension between what we see and what we'd like to see. Remember, when Ronald Reagan married, when Ronald Reagan married Margaret Thatcher, <laughs> and they had children. One of them was George Bush, and the other was Harper. And they ended up leading different countries. And a revolution occurred. And the revolution that occurred said there's no such thing as the social. The revolution that occurred said all that matters is possessive individualism. The revolution that occurred said profit making is the essence of democracy and that the obligations of citizenship are tied to consumerism. And that became a new model. And then a war began. And the war was waged against every public institution that did not support those commodified values. And so increasingly, we see these institutions being eliminated. And we see a language emerging that to me is at the essence of a totalitarian society, a pedagogical language. And that language is about the inability to translate the private troubles into larger social issues. We've lost the language of translation so that everything is individualized. We now individualize the social. When we talk about poverty, we talk about lifestyles. When we talk about homelessness, we talk about character. When we talk about racism, we talk about ignorance. All the systemic metaphors disappear, which, which, makes it, which makes people powerless because they blame themselves. I mean, there, there's nothing, there was nothing more excruciating than to sort of watch the news programs during the height of the subprime mortgage crisis. 
And you'd, people were being interviewed, and, and you'd see men and women get up there saying things like, oh my God, you know, I, 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 I'm not a good father. I'm, uh, you know, I'm not a good uh, homemaker, wife, or, you know, worker. Blaming themselves for a system that failed them because they had no other language. And I, and I, and I don't want to argue and end here by, arguing, by suggesting that language is really the only place we can go to sort of reinvent a world that needs to be changed. I want to argue that we need to think about what it means to create a formative culture that actually provides a language that links the notions of critique to traditions of the past, historical memory, public memory, with the need to revitalize a sense of individual and collective agency. One that's tied in some fundamental way to the gap between what is and what ought to be. That great sort of tension that has mobilized revolutions all over the world, mobilized institutions, allowed people to think otherwise in order to act otherwise. You know, I, 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 I think that, and I'll, I'm going to end here, I think that something is happening in the world today that's very encouraging. And what's happening is that people are recognizing that nothing is going to change simply by allowing yourself to get trapped in single issue issues. Don't get me wrong, single issues matter. Indigenous issues matter. Racism matters. Labor exploitation matters, but they've got to be brought together. We need a more comprehensive politics that links these things in ways that will be able to mobilize people into larger social formations. And we need to imagine not just simply reforming a society that's broken, we need to imagine eliminating it. We need a new kind of society. We need a new discourse. We need a new set of institutions. And maybe the place to begin to do that is to take seriously what it means to take education seriously, what it means to take pedagogy seriously, what it means to recognize that we're not just altering knowledge, we're altering consciousness, and we're creating new kinds of subjectivities, ones that don't define themselves exclusively in market values. Thank you. It was a wonderful lecture, thanks a lot. It hasn't been like this stimulating in a while, those lectures or any public events I've attended, so thanks a lot for sure. this. Uh, I have uh, one question and a couple of critiques. One is uh, I'm studying financial literacy, right. so I think that area itself is a way, now it's dominated by banks, right. trying to individualize all this financial problems right. to sell and man techniques to manage your own right. money so that supposedly you will be better, yeah. which is a big problem. But uh, the way to go about it in a critical pedagogical manner, I think maybe to articulate it, modify it, and make it a different curriculum, not just rejecting right. it together. Right. Like financial literacy in the sense that why those banks make all of those profits? Like, let's teach that. Financial right. 101, not about your personal finances. I think that might be a way to go. What would you think about that? I, do you want me to answer? Yeah. I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I think that to simply say that a particular paradigm is limiting doesn't mean that you dismiss it entirely. I think what, you mean, what it means is you work in it and try to find those spaces where you can expand it, where you can make it do something else. You can't get away today in, the, in, in North America we're not talking about financial literacy. It's everywhere, as you know, right? It's in public schools, it's everywhere. And it's an entirely individualized phenomenon because it operates off the assumption that if you learn the skills you need to be able to handle your finances, then you'll be fine. And I think you're right. I think the way, I think you can, under, you can there are three things you can do here. You can address this as an ideology and what it says and what its shortcomings are. Secondly, you can address the policies that legitimate it and what, what, what the absences are in those policies, right? Thirdly, it seems to me you can talk about what alternatives would have to be taken that go far beyond that, that would deal with the structural issues that would make the question of financial literacy irrelevant as we know it. Yeah. And you had to go ahead. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, I was just a little bit uh, uncomfortable by the comment where at this point people, bodies, the young generation is disposable. I find it's quite Eurocentric, right? People have been disposable for many It is now disposable for white people in the West. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's like the way we need to be critical. And also I think we, we need to be critical about glorification of the Keynesian 
post war era, it was a better version of capitalism for sure. Yeah, but yeah. It is a capitalism. I'm not a Keynesian at all. I, I don't believe the system should be reformed. I believe the system should be changed entirely. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not interested in Keynesianism. I, I, I understand the, dem, the social democratic position, and I understand the need for expanding social provisions, and I understand uh, the need for public services, but not within a system of financial capital that has such drastic inequalities and produces such misery and human suffering that that would be an answer. Around the question of disposability, let me sort of uh, uh, give you a sense of what I, why I chose that term. Right? I chose it because I'm, I'm not arguing that people haven't been disposable in the past. That's silly. We, you know, anybody who knows even a fourth grade notion of history understands that. What I'm arguing is that disposability is, is central to a form of neoliberalism it, that's unlike anything we have seen before in North America, in that you have a whole generation now that's considered disposable, that, that we've never seen that before. You know, you've never seen a whole generation be wiped out right, who don't seem to be a social investment, nobody cares about them, that's new. And I think that notion of disposability is useful in talking about a specific kind of politics in which the middle class now is all of a sudden being eliminated. I mean, how do we, what kind of theoretical work does that do, not in providing simply a global understanding of genocide in its multiple forms, but understanding the way in which capitalism has moved from its social democratic position to the great society, FDR, to all of a sudden a version that is so cruel, so indifferent to human life, that it really, it really suggests, as many people have argued, a new historical conjuncture. That is, it's a new historical conjuncture. It's not just you know, the, the, the evolving of something. I mean, I would argue that's new. Yeah, go ahead. I'm an engineer, I know, I know nothing about politics, but um, one, could it, one, one thing that we tend to do is look for examples. Are there any examples of systems or be, sets of behaviors around the world, can be in a little tribe in Brazil, or that's, that demonstrates the types of behaviors that you would like to see? As yeah, no, I, I, think that, I think that, look, one of the things, we, we catch glimpses in certain movements of the kinds of experiments that suggest alternative ways of living and being in the world. Argentina, when they decided not to pay back the loans, created workers' factories, they created councils, distributing foods, uh, defining ownership in very different ways. We, I mean, I, I hate to give you this example, but the Black Panthers <laughs> in the 1960s did something extraordinary. They did what the evangelicals learned how to do with even greater precision. They saw problems, for instance, not just in political or religious terms, they saw them in terms of social needs. So they created a breakfast, free breakfast programs. They created alternative institutions within a set of social movements that offered a countervail to prevailing ways in which institutions are organized. We saw it in Chile. We see it in the social democratic countries, which don't go far enough. But look, I'll give you a classic example. I mean, basic living wage or social wage. You know, when I say to my students, my graduate students, how do you feel about everybody getting $25,000 a year? Right off. Just being given, just so they can live. They go berserk. Holy shit. Uh, they'll be lazy, we, you know. They're just giving them money, you know. I mean, they can't imagine that there are countries that do this. That they have a social wage because they operate off the assumption that you can't have political rights and you can't have, you can't have social rights without personal rights. That political rights and, uh, and political rights and personal rights are meaningless without social rights. I mean, if you're poor, well, who can, how can you vote? Why would you be interested? If your whole life is caught up as a matter of survival, politics is meaningless in some ways. You don't even have time for it. So it, it seems to me, yes, we do see these moments. And I, and I think the question is a terrific question, and I think it demands not only a kind of inquiry. I, I mean, I'll give you another example. You know, when you, when I was born right after Lincoln died, right? And I, and I, and I think that, I, my, so I have a history. I can go back and I can remember that there were socialist schools in my neighborhood. There were communist party schools on the weekends. It's hard to imagine, right? Go to the communist party school, right? But they educated people like the synagogue did. They, were all, they, they had, you know, they had workers' study groups. 
And I think that what I'm arguing is that that question begs another question. And that question begs the question, what kind of organizational, what kinds of organizations need to be created that offer alternative public spheres that begin to model the kinds of societies that we'd want to see on a larger level, on a global level. And I think those struggles are worthwhile. Because you know, when you when you talk to diehard neoliberals, neoliberals, I mean like this, you know, this idiot. You know, that's now all over the news about, about the uh, marketing stuff. I mean, they say things like, oh, people are inherently evil. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it's the survival of the fittest is the only kind of mode of uh, competition that we can really buy into. You can't trust people. I mean, it's, it's, it's a kind of paralyzing cynicism that has no joy, no sense of solidarity, no sense of thinking in broader terms, no sense of the public good, no sense of justice. And that has become so enmeshed in, this, in, in the culture, particularly North American culture, it's everywhere. I mean, the question that we have to ask ourselves in light of going from that question to something else is, how do you explain the enormous spectacle of violence that now engulfs the United States? I mean, this is new. This is extreme violence everywhere. It's everywhere. It's in the videos, everyday life. It's in police terrorism. It's in domestic terrorism. It's in the militarization of almost everything. And you've got to ask yourself, what's, again, what's the formative culture that produces that? That's a pedagogical and political issue. That is not just a, an educational issue. Yes, yes. Um, thank you, very inspirational lecture. Uh, I hope you run for political office. You have my vote. <laughs> <laughs> but not if you run against Bernie Sanders. <laughs> that's, what I should, that's who I should precisely so, run against. <laughs> The, the comment I have is that the idea of a social wage is not only uh, something that comes out of socialism or like that. In the state of Alaska, every single Absolutely. person right. gets uh, yeah. an oil royalty, a check for which less than a okay. piece of production and it makes it very hard to change. Right. The, uh, the, the question I have for you is that I think you're being easy on universities and public institutions themselves. We ourselves have uh, produced this system, in a sense, by buying into the concept of human capital. What we've done is we've said that there is a labor surplus. And the only way the labor surplus can be addressed is if you can signal your human capital. And the more degrees you get, the more human capital you have. And the more human capital you have, the better life you will have. We don't adopt the rhetoric or the nomenclature of scholarship or citizenship. So I think that there is a rot within the university that needs to be addressed. Oh, no, no. I, forgive me if I went off in my talk and didn't address that. I've been writing about that for 40 years. You know, I mean, that, that is not a topic that I'm un unfamiliar with, nor is it a topic that I haven't engaged in ways that have gotten me fired. Um, <laughs> so, you know. I, I don't know what to say to you about that except to say, yeah, I, I have no trouble with that. I mean, I, I think the universities are utterly corporatized. I think they've sold out. I think the values that define them now are, for the most part, uh, insufferable. And I think they need to be changed. And I think if, if, the, if there isn't a revolution within the universities on the part of faculty joining with social movements and others, they'll get worse than they are. I mean, the universities are a contributing factor. Now, I say that, but at the same time, I don't want to equate power and domination in ways to suggest that they mutually inform each other and there's nothing else. The, th the other side of the university, there are public spaces within the university where there are real struggles going on, that they're not sutured in the, in the way that your discourse actually seems to suggest. I mean, I, I would argue there are faculty, I, I see some of them right in front of me, and students who are brilliant, you know, who are doing terrific things and are trying to, in some way, you know, make those places better places, both in terms of their own students and in terms of larger political projects. So I, I see the university as being corporatized, and I see that as part of, but I see it as part of a struggle. I don't see it as part of a sedimented history for which we're now paralyzed by virtue of what they've done. The issue here is to make that visible, address it, figure out how to mobilize against it, and don't f assume that you can only wage that struggle within the university. You can't do it. You know, I mean, you look at, look, we, we know this stuff. You look at Latin America. I mean, you look at Mexico, right, where governments don't want to, they don't want to have free education. And every time they suggest a tuition increase, I mean, hundreds of thousands of students are in the streets with social movements, you know, with, with labor unions, and they don't get the increase. The increase doesn't go through. And we, sent, we can't seem to learn from this. You know, we still cling to this fiction about the university being some kind of meritocracy. 
You know, that it's fair, that it's selective, its processes are, are, are egalitarian, that faculty are, are, are really generous around what they do. My God, I mean, it makes, you, it makes your head want to explode, right? And yes, uh, the university's a player. It's a player in the neoliberal regime. It's bought it. It's worse in the United States than it is in Canada. Uh, I, I mean, I'll take the classic example. You get a guy like the governor of Wisconsin who just dropped out of the presidential race. Here's a guy who now has abolished tenure in Wisconsin, right? He's abolished tenure and he's cut $200 million from the university budget and allocated $250 million for Milwaukee, Milwaukee Bucks basketball stadium. These are people who hate public education. So when we talk about the university being, uh, being corporatized, what you don't want to forget is that the struggle the university now is involved in, not just simply to maintain its corporatization, but to simply survive, is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. I mean, I think the pressure on administrators today, and there are a lot of great administrators here. I mean, there's one over here who happens to be my wife. You know, I mean, I, I, I think that you know, there, there's an upward struggle here, but there is a struggle. So I don't want to simply dismiss the university in that sense. I want to recognize its politics and where it's going. But I think the real issue is trying to understand that broader set of forces that are pushing it in certain directions in which it can't alone be blamed for the, uh, for the, uh, for the identity it's, as, as a corporation that it's now taken on. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, I've been really interested of late in cultural change and how you get um, a culture of people who are used to doing things the way they do things to change and do things differently. And especially from people who have no power. Yeah. The ones who are at the bottom rungs and who see things and they want it to change because they know it's going to be more effective in, in a different yeah. way. Um, and they know that if they say anything, their um, lives or careers uh, are at stake. So if you, like maybe because this touches on this idea of changing, have you seen any steps that individuals could take that tend to lead to success? Or that they should just stay right away from? No, I, I mean, I, I mean, I mean, the, the question is really dear to my heart, you know, because at some level, there's, there's, there's kind of a series of steps that we can talk about. I mean, there are people who are just unaware of what it means to change the circumstances in which they find themselves because they don't have the language. They don't have the theoretical language to do it. And I think in one way, that's not about ignorance. That's about a, a political vacuum that they tend to find themselves in. Secondly, there are people who have the language but are so structurally beaten down that it's very difficult for them to act for fear of being fired. What does it mean when you have, you know, look, in the United States, the, the, the poverty level for a family of, of, of four is $22,000. I mean, you know, $23,000. $23,000 for family of four. What, what does it mean when you're in the academy and you have a temporary job? And, you know, all of a sudden you're making $24,000 and you have kids to feed. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm not going to moralize and say, well, you should rise to the occasion. I'm going to say, man, I understand that. And I understand why the, 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 the gravity of what's to be said should be placed on people who, who have permanent jobs and, and should be speaking and doing it for, for people who could be fired instantly. And, I, and I, so I think that's the second issue. I think the third issue is that where, where it really begins to bloom around two issues, and tell me if I'm terribly wrong on this, okay? People who are downtrodden, and people who are oppressed, and people who often find themselves in a culture that's very different from their own, usually buy into something I think is despicable, and that is they're defined by their deficits rather than their strengths. The way they talk, the way they dress, you know? They don't dress like Keith Richards, right? I mean, they, you know, they, they, it's, it's always a matter of my agency, and this is true for my life, certainly. My agency is deficient because, you know, I, you know, I put my arm around people, I talk in the elaborated code, you know, I, I believe emotions should be linked to the body, I think music matters when you teach, you know, and you're in the rhythm of your voice. All the stuff that can get you fired. You have to flip the script. The script has to be flipped. And you flip the script by recognizing that the people who often define your deficits are the people whose, whose strengths are really deficits. <laughs> that the deficits lie on the other side. So that you can't be intimidated by the Oxford degree, the Brown degree, you know, the Ivy League degree. Doesn't mean, to me, it doesn't mean shit. I don't care about this stuff. You know, it's irrelevant to me. You know, show me what you write. Show me what you do. 
You know, show me how you act in the world. Show me what your sense of commitment is. That's what, that's what matters. And I think flipping that script all of a sudden unveils the possibility to be an agent in your own terms. Finally, you can't do it alone. You have to do it collectively. There's no way you survive doing this alone. No way. And you have to find ways to make it happen. Yeah. Um, so we were talking about changing minds earlier. I think so we were yeah, yeah. About, um, so we looked at sort of changing minds of people who don't have power. How do you change the minds of people who do have power? Who have like, who are older, they're wealthy, you know, they're outside of the educational system, they're not interested in the educational system. How do you change their minds? One response is why bother? But I'm not going to go there, you know. Uh, except to say that I'm far more interested in changing the minds of people who don't matter than I am of changing the minds of people who do matter. At the same time, I think it would be irresponsible to say that. I, th I think that people who have power are not always simply fascist. I think there are many people who have power who also are looking for ways to change the world in fundamentally important ways. And I think we have to find ways to make connections with them. I mean, I'm, I'm deeply disturbed by people who say, for instance, what you, I used to have something called the Global TV Network Chair, right? And there was always somebody who stood up and said, well, you have the Global TV Network Chair. You know, does that bother you? Like, I mean, is that, like, do you feel bad? I mean, are you endorsing corporations? That's like the people on the left used to say to me, you have a nice stereo, do you feel bad? You know? Uh, or when Leo Lowenstein was, was, was being interviewed by a, a Marxist from Germany who prided himself on living in poverty, and Lowenstein turns to him and he says, do you really think that poverty creates good theory? You know, I mean, it, there's, it, it, it seems to me that what, what needs to be done is we need to find people with power who have a sense of civic citizenship, you know, who need to redefine how that power can be used, to offer alternative languages for that, and to in some way provide them with spaces where it can actually happen. When I was interviewed by the Global TV Network chair people, when I got this job in 2004, this guy comes into my office and, you know, you can imagine what he looks like, right? He looks like he's right out of uh, one of uh, one of these business programs. And he sits down and he says, well, what are you going to do for us? You know, like, what are you going to do for global? I said, no, no, no. The question is, what are you going to do for me? I said, what are you going to do for the university? I said, what, is it, what are you going to do to define yourself as a, as, a, as, a, as a corporate citizen? As a corporate citizen. He left. I never saw him again. That was the end of the conversation. And I'm not saying that that had, I don't think it had a great impact on him. But I, but I do think it's, it, it offers an alternative discourse where we can open up a space to bring people in rather than assume a position of political purity where we say any intervention on the part of corporations is evil. You know, I, I mean, we have a certain amount of that in my department, you know, where people seem to believe that political moralism has a virtue. You know, we're actually, it only trades off shame. And, and, I, and, I, and I think that, how do you expand that dialogue? You know, how, how do you both invite people in, seduce them, use their power, and hope that in the end they don't have it anymore? Right? That it's gone. You eliminate it. You create the conditions for it to be gone. Yes? You're talking about involving different languages to respond. And at the same time, we're privileging rationality in a way that I think is really problematic in the sense that we are alienating others when we're saying, if this sleep of reason produces monsters, what happens to people who are inhabiting that space of monsters, to disability? How do we talk about creating a new common sphere or a public that doesn't become I, I, I don't think that the notion of monsters as it was used there was to talk about people who have disabilities. I think it was used to talk about people who are fascist. And I, and I, and I think that it, it does produce monsters. And I, and I think that the, the metaphor for me is not to assume that rationality is so unproblematic that it can't be interrogated. And we have a whole generation of Frankfurt School theorists who took the question of instrument, instrumental rationality, turned it on its head. Right? We have people in the 1960s who argue consistently against the culture of positivism, and I argue today against what I call a sort of deadly form of empiricism. Rationality comes in many forms. The real question, it seems to me, is whether we want to use it in the name of justice and be self-critical about how it's, uh, uh, it, its Eurocentric nature, or whether we want to use it in a way that reproduces modes of thinking that exclude the expressive, that exclude the emotional, that exclude the possibility for thinking in, in simply linear ways, and speak to other, 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 other forms of discourses. I mean, I, I think that, I, you know, for me, rationality is about reason. You know, how do we talk about reason? 
I mean, what role does reason play in an emancipatory project? I mean, for Iran, it was the essence of democracy. She talked about thoughtfulness, talked about the inability to dialogue, the inability to imagine what the other is thinking. That's a form of reason that should be condemned. A reason that opens that invitation is a reason that should be supported. Yes. Um, over the past couple, over the past year, I guess, we've been hearing all these stories about sexual assault on campus life. It, it very quickly turned into a whole bunch of dis discourses about um, about um, safety on campus and the university's re re responsibility to provide and ensure safe, safety students' um, rights to um, particular kinds of safety. And I just wonder if, if you could talk about this relatively new. But the phenomenon and the kind of changing idea of the rights to safety in the context of what you've been discussing. I, I mean, like, like anything else, nobody wants to argue against safety. What you want to argue against is a form of safety that so steps over the line in terms of what it means to be a victim and how you define aggression that all of a sudden it evolves into a form of censorship. It evolves into something else. And, I, and the argument for me is not to suggest that we don't take this question of, of safety seriously. I mean, particularly women's bodies around questions of rape and assault and sexual assault and how these things become institutionalized. The, the, the problem for me is how what in some cases might be a thera therapeutic problem becomes a universal discourse. So that we say, I can't be in your class and hear this because it's traumatic. You know, or don't, don't, don't breach my comfort zone I don't want to hear that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm curious about when that discourse becomes a form of abuse. When it becomes so generalized, it, it's, it empties itself out of any radical kind of insights into what violence really means and becomes a form of violence itself. And I think that dialectic we have to deal with. And I know you've written about this. I mean, I, it, it, you know, and maybe you might want to say something about it. Okay. I, I, I'm sorry. I say that because she's brilliant. <laughs> she's an utterly brilliant kid, you know, young woman. And uh, I'm always looking for an opportunity to showcase people like her. Yes. You talked about the Walmarting of yeah. education. And so I'm trying to think on a, on a much more local level. I mean, right. We talk globally. On a, on a very local level, how do we oppose this? And specifically, how do we oppose this in an environment where we're focused on, of course, budgets? where we have a government that talks about having 70% of the population go to post-secondary education, where we're teaching huge classes in many cases. How do you oppose the Walmart? You oppose it by redefining the nature of what the university should be. That's the beginning. If the university is not going to be defined as simply a corporation, but going to be defined as a public good, then it seems to me it begins to open a foundational discourse for talking about the ways in which the university is a democratic public sphere is being invalidated being invalidated. And, I, and it seems to me that's not just an internal discourse. That's a public discourse. And, I, and, I, and, I, and, and to go back, and I, I hope I'm not being too severe on this, but I, I mean, for me, one of the things that really makes me nuts you know, is how I increasingly find myself talking to academics who do have tenure, you know, who are on a tenure track line, you know, who have no interest whatsoever in, in addressing for one second the, 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 the uh, ability to defend their own jobs. I mean, I tell them, hey, look, what's at stake here is not just the corporatization of the university. What's at stake here is your position because it's going to be eliminated. You know? They're going to take away tenure. You know, they're going to say, oh, you have, to, you have to write 20 grants. If you write 20 grants, they will let you teach. And it seems to me that they, they don't even have a discourse, many of these people, to defend their own labor practices or their potential autonomy. That's going to change. I mean, that has to change. If the change doesn't first come within the university, it's not going to happen. And once it begins in the university, it can't stay there. It's going to migrate. You know, we have to link up with Walmart workers, with unions, so that pressures are brought to bear, not simply on the university, but on the governments that are establishing policies that universities now find very difficult to even implement. They're being starved of resources, being told that only certain colleges count as universities, being told that specialization is the only way to go, being told that the liberal arts are irrelevant, we don't need them anymore, get rid of the social sciences unless they want to work with the military industrial complex.
You know, that's, that seems to me to be the larger issue, yeah. Uh, you talked about the, the deadly empiricism so in education. So how do we use empiricism in education in a beneficial way? You use it in a way to suggest that it can mobilize itself on the side of issues that really matter and doesn't become enthralled as an end in itself and also become self-conscious of the ways in which it's being used to do terrific harm. You know, in a, I mean, I don't want to say you politicize it. I want to say you put it in a political project, in a political paradigm. Politicizing it means you're, it's being imposed in an unselfconscious, uh, in a, in a unselfconsciously way. Politicize, uh, making it political means that you can't talk about empiricism without talking about power. I mean, we're not just collecting data, right? I mean, we're collecting data for specific things. I mean, Susan tells me about a whole range of projects that are going on in the mental health field, I'm sorry, in the health sciences, in which big data is really useful. But remember, you live in a surveillance state. <laughs> That's the other side of data, right? I mean, you know, we have a whole generation now that doesn't believe in the rights of privacy. They can't run away from privacy fast enough. And so what they do is they align themselves with corporate surveillance. Put all, everything in the world on Facebook. Everybody has access to it. And it seems to me that, you know, unless this dialectic between power and emancipation and domination can be understood as part of a larger political paradigm in which we take up those questions, then they become reified, they become disconnected, instrumentalized. All right, thank you, I'm done. Henry, thanks for kicking off this series. This really has been a pleasure for not only me, but for I think every single person in the room. Thanks for your energy, your passion, the hard questions that you've raised. And thanks everybody for coming. Another round of applause for our first series. Thank you, Henry.